My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Paul Dubov as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story titled, It All Comes Back to Me Now. She was about medium size, brunette, beautiful, and bewildered. She couldn't remember where she'd come from or where she was going. Couldn't remember her own name. Just one thing she could remember... She wanted to commit murder. She was in the office of my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, that Friday morning, sitting there across the desk from him, holding onto her battered purse like it was the last thing in the world she was sure of. But the Lyon or I didn't know, she was right. Oh, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I've been waiting for you. Morning, Fatso. New client? Uh, Well, uh, yes, yes, Jeffrey. I think we could call her that. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, this is Miss... uh, Miss... uh... That's a very interesting name, Fatso. My name's Regan, Miss... Miss... How do you do, Mr. Regan? Uh, Jeffrey, she has a terrible problem. Somebody does. She can't remember her name. Please. Please, can't you help me? I don't remember anything. You remember how you got here to our office? No. Not anything. From when? From from now. Except, uh, there was a door. It, it said detective agency. I, I, I walked in. Uh, yes. Uh, Jeffrey, what are we going to do about Miss, uh, Miss, uh, 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 Smith? Smith? Well, we've got to call her something, haven't we? All right, Smith. Jeffrey, this is a matter for the police. A Bureau of Missing Persons. Surely if Oh, we... no, Mr. Lyon, please. Not the police. What's that? Oh, please, Mr. Regan, please don't let him call the police. People who can't remember their names usually can't remember they shouldn't go to the police, Miss Smith. But I... Oh... Look, lady, if you don't want to go to the cops, there's got to be a reason. Well, then... Then... Look at this. Hey, Jeffrey... 32 caliber revolver, Smith & Wesson. Loaded except for two empty shells. You see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Regan... The, the gun's been fired, Jeffrey? Two bullets missing. Miss Smith? I... I don't know. Hey, Jeffrey, that settles it. We call Lion, the police. I think Miss Smith hasn't quite finished her story. The gun in her purse isn't the only reason she doesn't want to go to the police. That right, Miss Smith? Mr. Regan, I... I try to remember. There was a... A house somewhere, a small house. I was in a room with... Go on. No. No, I can't. Keep trying, Miss Smith. I, uh... I was going somewhere, alone. I wanted to see someone. I... I think I was on my way to kill someone. Fatso, get some water. She's fainted. Here, water. Jeffrey, don't just stand there. Call an ambulance. The lion was right. Miss Smith wasn't just a quick faint. Her breath came in short, hushed spurts, and her pulse was a whisper. Beside her, the battered little purse had fallen open. Inside, $2.17 and a receipt for cab fare. No wallet... No identification. I picked up the receipt. It was dated that morning, Friday, and totaled $3.70. It was a lead. I sent the line with Miss Smith in the ambulance and then headed for the main office of the cab company. It took me two hours to get what I wanted. The receipt was for cab number 702, one of the new cars the company added, and it was usually driven by one Joseph Rupnick. Another hour passed, and he pulled into the cab stand out front of the main office. Joe Rupnick? Who else? Let's drive. My flag is down. Where to, Mac? Did you drive a medium-sized brunette this morning, Joe? Oh, it'd be a pleasure. Think. Fair complexion, good-looking, very good-looking. Carried a little black leather purse. The fare was $3.70. $3.70, huh? 
You know, it's a nice fare. What'll it buy, 370? Well, let's see. 370 should ought to take you out to Westwood. You got a record of your stops today. What about Westwood? Yeah, I guess I have. Hey, Mac, what do you know? She was lovely, she was engaged, and she used my cab. Oh, what a dish. Bewitched, bothered, and brunette. I seen her, and I'm glad. Never mind the tone poems. Where did you pick her up? In Westwood. Where else? Okay, let's go there. This is it, Mac. Right here on this corner. She was standing here. Naturally, I stopped. Naturally. Thanks. See you around. Oh, well, you're welcome, but I'm staying. Staying where? Now, look, right here, Mac. Look, you don't have to be a mind reader to spot you for a private eye. Shamus, a gumshoe. This means the jackpot. My cab is at your service. That's your business, Joe. Only keep your flag up. Shouldn't worry about a thing. Besides, when else do I get a chance to check the horses at Tamforan? <laughs> Joe Rupnick pulled a racing form out of his pocket, and I looked at the place he'd pointed out. According to Joe, Miss Smith had been standing in front of a white, one-story building with a two-story sign that said, Parker Service. It was an auto repair shop, a big one, the kind that specializes in foreign cars, custom sedans, and rich customers. Mr. Parker, telephone call, Mr. Parker. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, uh, uh, sir? I, I am looking for a girl. She uh, she used to work here. Sarah? You're looking for Sarah? About medium size, good looking. Yeah, yeah, that's Sarah. Well, she quit yesterday. She was in here this morning to pick up her check. Me, I'm just taking her place. And it's not a bad job. Not bad at all. Mr. Parker, he's a nice guy. A very nice... Could you oh, give me... pardon me just a moment, please. Parker service? Yeah. Yeah, just a moment, please. Uh, could you give me Sarah's address? Huh? Uh, could you give me Sarah's address? Well, I could check for you. You see, I'm new here and sure. I... Sure. Uh, by the way, what's Sarah's last name? I've forgotten. Sarah Hansen. <laughs> so you didn't know her very well, did you? Blind date. Oh, yeah. I understand. And she forgot to give you her address. Sure, I'll find out for you, mister. <laughs> Glad to. <laughs> the girl behind the counter winked at me and went back into the office, and before I could turn around, there was somebody at my elbow. And I, I had that feeling you get when you know someone's staring down your neck. I turned, and I was right. Tall man, neatly dressed, business suit, about 35. Suntan that spelled 18 holes of golf on Sunday, private club, chamber of commerce. I beg your pardon, sir. Did I overhear you asking for Sarah Hanson? Maybe you did. My name's Parker. Mine's Regan. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to step into my office. Okay. This way, Mr. Regan. You see, I happen to be particularly interested in the girl, Miss Hanson. She's unusually intelligent, a superior worker. I hated to see her leave. Here we are, Mr. Regan. Have a chair. A cigarette? No, thanks. Let's stick to Miss Hanson. Oh, yes, Mr. Regan. I was quite curious at your interest in Sarah Hanson. She, uh, she's not the sort of girl to have many, shall we say, gentlemen friends. Really? What sort of girl is she? Well, more on the quiet side. Intelligent, as I've said, and not at all emotional. Sarah was a very superior, superior worker. worker. Come on, Parker, I haven't got all day. A girl quit her job and you want to know why, is that it? Well, I'm curious. There's more to it than that. I saw four secretaries in your front office alone. One named Sarah wasn't that good. Very well, Mr. Regan. I'm going to tell you the truth. Certain malcontents, certain vicious elements in my organization, irresponsible rumor mongers have been saying that Miss Benson and I... Well, there isn't a word of truth in it. I'm still listening. I'm a happily married man, Mr. Regan. You understand what rumors of this sort do to a man. Go on. I'm going to put a stop to it. You understand? Once and for all, I'm going... Okay, okay. Take it easy, Parker. I'm sorry I lost my temper, Mr. Regan. This thing has been gnawing at me for months. That's why I finally discharged Miss Hanson. That's what you've been trying to say. You fired Sarah Hanson. You think that's why I'm here? Well, uh, yes, I... It's just a job, Mr. Parker. We all got to make a living. (laughs) 
Somewhere in it, a story was beginning to take shape. Parker apologized again, and I left his private office. Out front, the receptionist had Sarah Hansen's address, and I took it. When I got through the street, Joe Rupnick's cab was still sitting there. Hop in, Mac. I'm available. You find the gun? No, but I've got an address. Great. I got them all lined up for tomorrow at time for Ant. Let's go. It was past Pico on Bentley. It took us five minutes to pull up in front of a bungalow converted into a duplex. I left Joe with his racing form and newspaper and went up to the door that belonged to Sarah Hansen. I rang the doorbell. No answer. I knocked. Same results. The sun was sinking somewhere in the distance and the early mist, the prelude to fog, was settling in fast. I tried the doorknob. No results. And then something told me to get inside that apartment, to get in with or without a permit, with or without a key. I walked around back until I found a window unlocked. The screen was easy, and I climbed up. My stomach scraped across the windowsill, and I was inside. Dark, dank, stale-smelling air. Something foul and disagreeable. I wanted to turn and leave and get out of the stinking apartment. But I didn't. Instead, I moved slowly along the wall in the darkness and fumbled until I hit the light switch. The lights didn't change the smell, but it told a story. Chairs upside down. Picture frame smashed to the floor. Two dishes broken in a thousand pieces and the sofa cushions on top of each other in a corner. The whole place turned upside down, looking like a clapboard shack after a hurricane. I moved into the living room, picking up pieces, searching for anything. And I found something. In front of the imitation fireplace on the carpet, a pool of blood. Hey, Mac! You okay? Yeah, Joe. Look, Mac, I think I got something important. Be there in a minute. Never mind. I'll climb through the window. Hey, look, Mac, I want you to take a look at this. I was reading while I was waiting for you. Early edition of the afternoon paper. Yeah, yeah. Look on page two. Did you find it, Mac? Yeah. I found it. I found it. Story on page two. The body of a girl found washed up on Will Rogers State Beach, tentatively identified as Sarah Hansen. This is CBS, and you are listening to tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator, entitled It All Comes Back to Me Now. CBS brings you many of the most exciting programs on the air. For example, Sundays at 5.30. A Face in the Shadows, a Bloodstained Bernoose, a Beautiful Dancing Girl may set Rocky Jordan on an exciting adventure in ancient Cairo. Follow Rocky Jordan as he moves through the dangerous streets of the capital of Egypt. Meet Rocky Jordan this Sunday at 5.30 on CBS. And now, back to tonight's story titled, It All Comes Back to Me Now, and Jeff Regan, Investigator. Joe, the cab driver, stepped on the gas, and we headed for the police. I sat in the back seat, the folded newspaper in my lap, and tried to make sense out of a story so twisted even the principal characters no longer made sense. A girl with amnesia hires the lion and me to help her find herself. She says she remembered wanting to kill someone. She collapses, and I follow a lead to a cab driver, to a repair shop in Westwood, to the home of one Sarah Benson, 
That was when I read the early afternoon paper which said a girl had been found washed up on Will Rogers State Beach. Her name, Sarah Hansen. It was getting late. Streetlights turned on, traffic jamming and honking its way up sunset. But that didn't stop Joe Rupnick from hitting 40 between the cars. We made the police station at 6.45. Okay, thanks, Joe. That does it. What do you think, I'm leaving? Me, a sucker for a mystery? I gotta know how this comes out. It took me 15 minutes to get to Lieutenant Candid. Hi, Regan. Candid, I got a couple of questions. Yeah. Regan, I am tired to the very bottom of my large, flat feet. Let's make it tomorrow. It can't wait. All right, Regan. What's her name? Listen, Candid, all I want to know is where you got your identification for Sarah Hansen. Sarah Hansen, age 27, height 5'4", weight... My 117 hair, blonde eyes, brown. Blonde. That's what I said, wasn't it? You fished her up off Santa Monica? Uh, you know, Will Rogers State Beach. We didn't find her. Some swimmers did. They called. You weren't looking for her? Looking. We didn't know Sarah Hansen from my friend Irma. What's eating you, Regan? Can't it just tell me something else? Who identified the girl for you? Only her mother and father and brother and sister, that's all. Okay, can't it? Sorry I bothered you. It's all right. We can't find the murder weapon. We haven't got a lead on the killer, and I gotta talk to you yet. She was shot? Two slugs in her chest. Thirty twos. Maybe Smith and Wesson. Gun's missing. That part of it wasn't in the papers. Uh, don't we look bad enough already without making it worse? All we got on this case is a body. Even if it is a nice one. When was she killed, Candid? Uh, this morning, somewhere between one and two AM, the coroner says. That isn't all. What else? Well, from the tire marks they found up the beach, there was another idea. We think maybe she was shot somewhere else and then driven down to the beach. This Sarah talked. Hansen, she worked? Yeah, a place out in Westwood. Called, uh, Parker's Service. Yeah, we'll check everyone out there. Takes time. What about an address, Candid? Where did she live? Well, the parents say she moved out of their place a couple of months ago. Seems they had a fight. Uh, she and the parents. She wouldn't tell him where she was moving. They tell you anything else? Uh, Sarah Hansen was afraid of something, they said. Had him worried. That's when the fight started. She used to get phone calls from a woman. A woman? Yeah, every time this woman called, Sarah would leave the phone crying. Only happened a couple of times. Did they ever see this woman? Nope. They were wondering if it might be another girl who worked with Sarah. You know, feud. Only you haven't checked the employees yet. Like I said, Regan, it takes time. Shop opens up first thing in the morning. My men will be there. Thanks, Candid. Thanks a lot. Hey, Regan, where do you fit in this? Client, Candid. You know how it is. Maybe I don't, Regan. If you know something... I don't know anything, Candid. You wouldn't lie to me, would you? Sarah Hansen was a good-looking dame. A real good-looking dame. I never met her. You sure, Regan? I'm sure. Okay, I'll take your word. She's a real nice-looking name, like I said. Kind you hate to see turn up dead. You want to see her, Regan? All right, Candid. We'll see her. Candid and I went to the morgue. We saw her. Sarah Hansen. Medium-sized, good-looking blonde. She looked nothing like the girl who'd come to the lion's office without a memory. Yet somewhere, Sarah Hansen and Miss Smith fit together. Somewhere their lives became crossed and tangled up and then went separately again. Miss Smith's to a blank memory. Sarah Hansen's to death. Somewhere something made both things happen. That gave me an idea. I went upstairs to missing persons and checked every record I could find that even faintly resembled our client, Miss Smith. Nothing did. I headed outside. Joe Rupnick was still sitting in the taxi. He turned it around and we headed for the L.A. County Hospital. There you are. Trouble, Fatso? Trouble? I've been sitting here all day, wasting time and money. How's she doing, Fatso? Is she? 
Oh, Miss Smith, fine. She's doing fine. Doctor says she was merely weak from too much tension brought on by the amnesia. Good, Lion. I think we may have something. We may have something. You're darn right we have something. Hospital bills, doctors, nurses' bills. Every time the door opens to that girl's room, I add another five dollars. Jeffrey, this is ridiculous. We're not Fort Knox. How do you think the Lion Detective Agency can pay for Take these bills? Take it easy, Fatso. Remember, it was your idea to bring Miss Smith here. So what if it was my idea? That's right, Lion. You call the ambulance. Well... Well, that's no reason why we have to pay... Mr. Lyon, I'll have to ask you not to raise your voice. Uh, uh, Yes, Miss Wilton, (laughs) yes. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Sitting here all day, wasting your time. Oh, now, Jeffrey, after all, a man has to do something. Sure, Fatso. You keep an eye on those nurses' bills. I'm going in to see our client. Miss Smith was lying there, pale face made paler by the whiteness of the sheets, the white hospital walls, the clinical smell of the room. You don't have to be sick to look sick in a hospital bed. Oh. Hello, Mr. Regan. You remember me. (laughs) You helped me, Mr. Regan. I won't forget that. What does the doctor say? Oh, I'll be all right. Really, I will. It's just my mind. I can't think straight. But you remember about the gun, the two bullets missing? Yes. Yes, I remember about them. Do you remember anything more? I don't think so. About wanting to kill someone? Oh, Mr. Regan. You don't remember that part of it? The, the doctor says it's... it's he says it, it's shock. Something happened to me. Something I wanted to forget... Made me forget everything. Murder might do that. Yes, I, I... I suppose it might. Does the name Parker mean anything to you? No. Parker Service, Westwood? No, Mr. Regan. How about Sarah Hansen? No, Mr. Regan, I don't know that name. Sarah Hansen, the blonde, pretty blonde. No. No, 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 I don't remember. She worked for Parker Service in Westwood. You were in Westwood today. Maybe no. at a small apartment no, on Bentley just past Pico. That, that mean anything, anything to you, Miss leave Smith? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me okay, alone. Okay, thanks. Thanks anyway. Please leave me alone. <laughs> Mr. Regan, leave me alone. Somewhere the paths of Sarah Hansen and Miss Smith crossed. Somewhere their lives were woven in and out of each other until it was so mixed up and... Then it made sense. Simple, quick, easy sense. I left the hospital in a hurry, the cab was there, and I got in, and we drove and drove fast. First for a drugstore and a phone booth, then for Westwood. What are we doing here? Visiting Joe. Yeah, don't sound friendly somehow. You sit tight. I'm going in. Look, that house is dark. Nobody's home, Mac. Maybe, maybe not. If I'm not out in ten minutes, get to a phone and call the police. You got that? Yeah. Call the cops. It was 50 feet back from the street. Not a mansion. Not a little house. Grounds well kept, lawn neat and trimmed. I moved slowly up the walk toward the front door. The fog had settled on Westwood Village and the soft dampness sifted under your clothes made your skin turn cold. Up ahead, the dark house, waiting. I changed my mind, moved along the side of the house toward the fireplace. That might mean den, and the den might mean proof. Around back, a patio and French doors next to the red brick. Still no sounds from the dark house. I tried the French doors. It was the den. Books, heavy leather chair, and desk. On the desk, a photograph, too dark to see. I picked up the metal frame and lit a match. It fit. The final nail in a murderous coffin. You like the photograph? Get your hands off your gun, Mr. Regan. That's better. Only one of us needs a gun just now. Just you, Parker. The photograph is almost a perfect likeness, isn't it? Beautiful woman. But not beautiful enough for you, was that it? 
Beautiful but possessive. She didn't understand me. And Sarah Hansen did. Jane killed her. So that's her name, Jane Parker. Too bad you've never met her, Mr. Regan. I've met her, Parker. In fact, I just left her less than 30 minutes ago. It's a lie. You've never met my... Your wife, Jane Parker. She, she asked for help. Regan, you're lying. You tell me a better story. Where is your wife? I... I don't know. But you'd like to, wouldn't you? You'd like to know so you could see her once more, so you could see her and shut her up. She told you. Did you kill Sarah Hansen? She was lying. She killed Sarah there was a fight. Jane killed her in a jealous rage. Then you're going to try to tell me Jane carried Sarah Hansen to her car, then took her to the beach, and then threw her body in the... I left. I don't know what happened. It was Jane. Jane carried a woman her size down to the ocean. Who do you think you can make believe that? You're lying. I'll tell you what really happened. Jane found out you were running around with another woman, Sarah Hansen. She phoned Sarah, tried to reason with her. Your wife was dumb enough to want to keep you... When Sarah wouldn't listen to reason, your wife went to see her. You don't know what you're talking about. She found you at Sarah Hansen's apartment on Bentley. There was a fight. You lost your temper, Parker. Only a man your size could erect the place the way it is now. No. You shot and killed Sarah, and the shock was too much for your wife. No. Her mind went blank, went completely blank, rather than remember the nightmare she'd seen. How, how do you know? How? Because I know where your wife, Jane Parker, is right now. She didn't tell you that. She wouldn't dare tell your you. Your wife disappeared after the shooting early this morning, didn't she, Parker? You didn't know where she'd gone. That's what you really wanted to find out from me when I was at your shop this afternoon. You're afternoon. making that up. You were afraid then and you're afraid now. Yet you didn't report to the police that your wife was missing. I checked that. You didn't want them to find her either. She could tell the real story. Where is Jane, Mr. Regan? You're wasting time. Unless you tell me where my wife is, Mr. Regan, I'll put every bullet in this gun through your body. And that still wouldn't stop your wife from talking, would it, Parker? That still wouldn't give you the answer to where she is tell now. Tell me, Regan. Go ahead, go ahead, shoot, Parker. Shoot and read the morning papers tomorrow. The headlines will tell how every cop on the West Coast is waiting to shoot you on sight. Regan! So you won't need that gun! Let go! You pull the trigger on yourself, Parker. Too bad your aim wasn't better. Dr. Dana. Dr. Stephen Dana. Sixteen dollars a floor. day for room. A private nurse. Hi, Hi, Apatso. Uh, hmm? No, don't bother me, Jeffrey. I'm very busy. A room at sixteen dollars a day. How's our client, Lyon? Uh, she doing okay? Sixteen dollars a day. Hmm? Yeah, what's that, Jeffrey? Miss Smith, our client. No, oh, you mean Jane Parker. Oh, why didn't you say so, Jeffrey? She's much better. The doctor says it'll take time, though. Yeah, let me see now. If you take 16... Do you think she'll get her memory two, back, Lion? Uh, uh, what? Oh, oh, yes, yes. He thinks it's just a matter of time. Uh, mental block, that sort of thing. Very complicated, you understand. Oh, hey, Jeffrey, it's been a long day. You must Dr. be tired. I am a little. Come on, Fatso, I'll drive you home. Yeah, uh, me? Mm -hmm. Oh, home? Uh, uh no, no you, you just run on, Jeffrey. I, I, I really couldn't leave just yet. You, you see, I've got it figured so the city will have to pay oh, for the hospital expenses. Oh, you can figure that out at home, Fatso. You look tired. Well, uh, 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 no, no. You, you see, Jeffrey, I, I'd better stay right here where I can get the course firsthand. Uh, that way I'll have it accurate when I charge the city. Uh, you know me, Jeffrey. <laughs> business before pleasure. Oh, yes, business before pleasure. Uh, yes, I I'm not satisfied until I've completely finished the case. Uh, uh, you look peaked, boy. You, you, you run along, get some sleep. Me? Well, I'll just sit here and work. Finish my job. I'm all ready, Mr. Lyon, if you are. Uh, the night supervisor said it would be all right if I left early. Uh, Isn't that just grand? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, good night, Jeffrey. Good night, Fatso. Jeff Regan, Investigator, was written tonight by William Frug, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Paul DeBove as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.